and she orders it. And when it comes to her house, she's all happy and she opens it up and runs into the bathroom to immediately apply it uh, to her lips in the mirror. And as she does so within 10 seconds, guess what happens? Her lips are super glued together. Before we get started with the show, here's a quick word from our sponsor, Global Training Center. As trade compliance professionals, you want to make sure that your procedures and documentation are completed as correctly as possible to avoid any delays and possible fines. We provide a range of trade compliance courses that will fit your needs. From in-person or web training to recorded on-demand courses, we can train one or even thousands on your team through your learning platform or on our portal. We can even customize a private session for your team. Go to globaltrainingcenter.com to find out more. All right. Vinny, I listen, you and I go back a ways and I appreciate uh, you coming on the show. So with this, let me just jump right on um, interoperability, I believe is the term. So what the Sam Hill is that? You know, you're dealing with somebody as dumb as a box of rocks, buddy. So I assume it's multiple uh, operations, but what what do you got going here? Well, Andy Lalo, thanks, thanks for having me and uh, happy new year to both of you. Um, I will tell you that, uh, uh, I'm working on some pretty exciting stuff and, and it's not just interoperability, it's global interoperability that I want you to be aware of. So global uh, interoperability, really what they are is a couple of standards that we're using um, in order to communicate, uh, you know, to, through multiple systems. So interoperability in and of itself means that one system can communicate with another. So don't confuse that with like open source where you can take a file and put it on uh, all those things. But um, if I can go back just a little bit, um, we started out in, in around, uh, I picked up innovation around 2017, late 2017 into 2018, and we started experimenting with blockchain. And at the time, you would have thought that it was going to solve world hunger, world peace, <laughs> and distributed <laughs> ledger was the way to go. Um, you know, and I had to weed through those things. And um, so when I got involved with it. Uh, as you can tell, I'm not the greatest cheerleader in the world, uh, but I, I, I'm hesitant because of all the experience that I have in, in doing IT related work. Um, so throughout that experimentation, we actually did two pieces that were pretty interesting and I, I don't really have enough time to discuss them. But what it started to prove out is that we didn't need a blockchain system in and of itself. There were some areas for the government that weren't proving successful for us, right? It, was, it would have pigeonholed us into a technology. We would have forced all of the community onto that technology as well. So we pivoted to global interoperability. Um, and, and those two pieces break down into two forms. One is a decentralized identifier, and the other is a verifiable credential. Now, um, the decentralized identifier is a unique ID number so that, you know, Andy or Lau, if you guys are on with a network with me on network A, you can recognize me. And then I move over to network B or C and you follow me over there. You can always recognize me. But what you can't do is you can't steal my persona, right? You, you can't come in and imitate me because I have what's called a private encrypted key. Right. So that is a very already a very safe notion of being able to keep data intact. You always know where things are coming from, from origin. So to, to just to stop, so basically what the advantage of blockchain is, is uh, and in this technology, what we were talking about, it gave a or it gives in a sense in, in the concept is a an audit trail digitally on the files and, and whatnot so that. Uh, if there was a change, you could backtrack to say who did the change and where did it come from and when did it happen, correct? Yeah, well, now we're not going into blockchain, so I don't want you to confuse that. We're, we're moving okay. into a standard, and there's a, and there's a strong reason for that, um, and that is that when you're creating that layer, um, I don't have to tell anybody what type of system to use. They can make those determinations themselves, right? All right, so what you can do, though, in in – with the, the digital credentials, which was, uh, the, and the other part is the verifiable credentials before I forget to talk about that. And that's the vehicle in which the data is actually passed. Um, so what you can do is when you receive data from someone, you can go back and authenticate it. So let me give you an example of that. So, 
Um, let's say I am speeding out on the road and Andy, you're a police officer. So you pull me over. Now you can't just ask me for an ID, but what you're going to ask me for is my license, right? So I pull out my license and I show you and you look at all the attributes and you say, my gosh, that is the closest thing I've ever seen to Superman. No, I'm kidding. But you go through all the attributes <laughs> and you can, you, you can see that, you know, I got brown eyes, I'm five foot, whatever, my weight, and you start to apply apply those but what's the one thing that you don't know if that is actually truly you right that is right because that card could be fraudulent so what does the officer do he goes back or she goes back to the the car and runs it through the dmv we're able to do that now through automation our current systems don't do automatic automated verifications right now for, for your viewers, what might be interesting, if you don't mind, I'm going to digress for a second into something a little a anecdotal to make sure that I can drive some points home on the mission of customs and, and the private sector along with us, right? I was watching a documentary and it was talking about an online service where you can go and order products and, and they, they start interviewing this young lady. Andy, I'm talking. 17 years old, nondescript, wouldn't have recognized her out on the street, right? And um, you come to find out that she's an internet influencer and has one and a half million followers. And her specialty is in cosmetics, okay? So, okay, great. They flip over to this other person who's the same nondescript and winds up being a follower. And the influencer had, had told them, hey, order this lipstick. It's the greatest thing since sliced bread. I just dated myself, right? The, the, um, order this lipstick. This is the one that you have to get. So what does this, this young lady do that's a follower? Well, she does what human nature says. Let's look online and find the cheapest I can find of that product. And I'm going to order it. And she orders it. And when it comes to her house, she's all happy and she opens it up and runs into the bathroom to immediately apply it uh, to her lips in the mirror. And as she does so within 10 seconds, guess what happens? She has some kind of a alert, uh, allergic a reaction or something. Or something. Yeah. Her mm -hmm. lips are super glued together. Could you imagine? Oh. <laughs> she had to go to the emergency room. Now, oh my who's gosh. at fault for that? The online service, right? The documentary held the online service, the one that was selling the product at fault, even though it was a business to consumer exchange. So, what you really start to find is how difficult a mission we have, which is we've got to find that lipstick in the haystack, right? How do we, amongst all these different products, find something that small to protect the consumer? And this is a shared mission between, you know, governments and uh, customs agencies and the private sector, because the last thing that the private sector wants to do is get blamed for those types of products, because then it's looking at them as not being legitimate. And ultimately with everything that we're doing right now in the global interoperability standards is trying to prove legitimacy of the, um, the entity and the product, right? So the company and the product. And if you know that you've got legitimate products and legitimate entities that are moving these goods, it starts to allow you to curtail your workforce towards the problem areas to do more and more work in those areas that are, we're blind to. Okay, so uh, I'm going to go through the process. I, I, what I'm hearing is absolutely phenomenal because it's going to dramatically improve, if you will, the productivity of – and I say productivity. I'm not saying it from you know just a work perspective. It's going to – those that are the good corporate citizens that have filed appropriately, that have the appropriate things on on file, if you will, the databases, and they're making the data available and, and those kinds of things. So as their shipments come through, the system will, through automation, as you're going, I'm, I'm, I'm going to try and recap this here, is that it's going to match up things and go, you know what, this is legitimate looks good somebody if they still want to do a, a next uh, a human look to it they can do it but pretty much that's going to match up for those shipments that are coming through that it's an unknown entity it's an unknown product all of a sudden there's nothing that we, you know your your systems go out to the appropriate sources and find nothing it's going to in a sense bring that up to say hey somebody needs to look at that 
Is that a good recap of what I've got here, what I'm hearing, yeah, what you're doing? Yeah, you're really getting into a scenario where um, facilitation uh, – now, I, I can't stop people who lie, right? Um, if there's some physical um, way of that somebody's going to try and smuggle something in, we can't see that through the data. I don't think anybody's job is going away. But the idea of authentication, you know, and, and we're not even talking about AI and all that other stuff yet that you can layer over it. But ultimately, if you think about it in, 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 in mass of what we're doing is we're building a transparent supply chain that's going to start from the beginning and work its way all the way in. And on top of that, if we ever needed to follow something into the domestic movements of our country as well, we could do that as well, because ultimately you focus on the product, which is like a kite. And then you think about a tail that's connected and a tail is everything that happens to that product along the way. So it's really transformative. Um, we're, we're very excited about the potentials of this. And, um, you know, we did 2023 testing. We have 2024 testing as well. We did pipeline and oil in 23. We're doing e-commerce, food safety and natural gas in 24. And I have international tests as well. Um, so I'm doing stuff with other countries. We're working with the border five, working with IDB bank now with the Latin and South American countries to exchange credentials and see how that goes. It's really, really interesting work. So, and so Vinny, truly sh go ahead, Lalo. I'm sorry. No, what I was going to say, Vinny. So, I mean, and, and maybe I'm misunderstanding or not getting the full like scope of this, but what, and, and I'm going to jump into forced labor because that's obviously one of the hot topics uh, around. And um, so does this or could this answer that question or that problem that every almost everybody says is I, I have a supplier, but I don't know my supplier suppliers because they don't want to tell me who those suppliers are only because obviously I can jump them and, you know, go straight to those guys to get get products. Would that solve that problem? I mean, am I am I am I? I mean, am I going down the wrong path? I mean, is this so, kind of... Lalo, I'm, a, I'm optimistic on this, so I think I can solve anything if you give me a shot to do it, right? But um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Hey, um, hey yeah. folks, just so you know, and Lalo, I'm going to tell you, Vinny's the type of guy, he's so optimistic when it comes to innovation. Now, he's realistic, but I'm going to tell you, this guy would go after Moby Dick in a rowboat and take the tartar sauce with him. He's that optimistic. He's good. <laughs> So I have to be careful with forced labor, and I do work in that area, so I, I have to stay at a, a generic level. But I would say it's there's not one a one-stop shop for forced labor, okay? Um, but it certainly sets the baseline. Now, you asked an interesting question. I don't know if you caught it, but proprietary information, how would I guard somebody from getting into a supplier's supplier? We, we developed something called a workflow ID. So when we're, when we were beginning the process, we use something very new called an intent to import, which kicks off the process. And then everything that takes place in that pre-arrival arena has an umbrella ID code, right? That workflow ID can actually be given to um, a supplier supplier and they can send that information in without um, giving away that data to somebody who might actually use it against them later on. So we can do that even with online services. Like if you didn't want to expose who your carrier was for whatever reason, um, you could do that as well. So all of this information that we're collecting is based on a need to know. And, and one other thing that I want to tie in here that I didn't recommend, uh, that I didn't uh, reference earlier is that we did um, some studies when we were looking at ACE as we were looking at ACE 2.0 with uh, the um, the uh, COAC. And right now, um, because I think I'm online, I've just forgotten what the acronym stands for, the Customs uh, yeah, Operational um, Advisory Committee. And, uh, but anyway, <laughs> um, when we went through the supply chain with them, we really found that the government didn't have any insight into that first third of the supply chain. So just filling that hole in um, really helps – uh, bolster that and also sets a level, level playing field among all the nations um, that are, we're engaging with. Um, on the forced labor, just to finish the point, 
So if you can set a baseline where you can track, um, you know, all of the entities, you still have the difficulties. Um, you, you have to use other technologies. And I know that we did a forum back in, I think it was in February uh, of this year, uh, last year. And we exposed some of the technologies that we are starting to use. And I think companies, if they're interested, should look to see the who those are and engage with them as well. But definitely setting that baseline for forced labor, green trade, um, even potentially handling smart devices and all of that, this type of system really lends itself well to all of it. Yeah, and we have a lot of those resources available on one of our previous podcasts. One of your colleagues, uh, Brian Hoxie, came on and uh, we, we listed a lot of that on, on there because uh, he did talk about those. So th thank you. Thank you, Vinny. Thanks for, for, for that answer. Well, let me ask this is that as you're going through on this, I guess I love the, the, the deal where countries now are, you know, if you will, customs is sharing information for the scenario of trying to protect each other's countries with, you know, obviously goods that are moving, uh, trying to stimulate trade. The whole idea here is to me, this is a great way as I know CBP seems to be moving right now more in an enforcement mode of late, but there's still a strong desire for the facilitation of trade, which is great. You stimulate trade. It helps, you know, both countries and all that. As you're looking at this, though, it, is this, are you looking at it more from a cargo security, if you will, perspective in what you're working on right now, this interoperability situation, or is it more from, you know, entry quality? Well, it's everything. Um, it, See, the things that we're experimenting with, and, and it's, it's, it's a shame it's such a short amount of time, but like we're, we're working with, um, GS1 and Glyph right now. So you can get, uh, global, uh, global GBIs, right? The, uh, global business indicators. You can get, um, uh, the GTINs, which are really discrete methods of describing a product. So I would know Nike Air Jordans, white hair tops with purple shoelaces, right? Um, as opposed to just getting some handwritten information or an HTS classification, I think these are stronger methods. Um, but one of the things that I want you to ask me, but I'll do it for you. Yeah, please, <laughs> please do. Who, what are we doing with the countries? Well, we're on the verge of developing a global AEO CTPAC credential. Oh my goodness. Okay. That is, all right. So yeah, you mean there's an actual collaboration on getting that trusted trader concept put into place and actually put into a scenario where you're using, all right, keep going. This is yeah. great. Nice. All yeah. right. So what you're going to do is we're going to baby step into this. It's not going to ha happen overnight. The test is going to prove out whether or not we can exchange credentials between countries. And we may even invite the private sector in so that we can issue a credential to a private partner and then have them reveal that credential to us. But what it does is right now you have to go in and apply at uh, one country. And then there's a very archaic way of getting MRA mutual recognition arrangement benefits with another country. So we want to automate that. But the eventual outcome is that we could potentially use the credential and it could just be exposed as the, co the company comes in on the cargo transaction. And we can determine right there and then whether or not we're going to issue benefits just like that instantaneously. And we verify it because we know the country issued it. So it's got country of origin, right? So you would have like, remember I was just talking about a did earlier a decentralized identifier. So you would know the country that it's coming from the agency that it's coming from, right? And then you'd even get a little, um, so, some kind of an image so that we know that, that that piece is following through. The reason why I mention agency is because what happens if, for instance, on the US side, CTPAT and FDA come into an agreement and they want to facilitate trade? Well, now you can issue an FDA. Now, here's the trick question we haven't figured out yet, and we'll be doing that for the test. Is, is it us issuing on behalf of FDA or does FDA issue directly the, the credential? Cause we could do it either way. 
So it's things like that that we're starting to figure out. But we've already got this notion um, of being able to issue credentials. And it will be the first time that U.S. Customs has issued a credential ever. By the way, we're with the W3C, uh, which is the World Wide Web Consortium, which is how the Internet came about. And we're also with the IETF. Don't ask me what that acronym stands for because I never get it straight. Um, but we have um, international standards groups. If all of this works in the long run, and Andy, you know best that I, I designed that, I uh, was the business architect for the single window. If we really truly want to look at an international single window where it's one place to submit your data for transnational companies and they want to submit it in one spot and it goes to wherever it's got to go to, I think this is the type of system that would lend itself well. Because if we don't do something that's got, you know, that one standard, you're going to just stitch together a bunch of these single windows and you're going to have a patchwork. It's going to be like a greenhouse, right? It's not really going to be a single window. And I'm a purist when it comes to that. So I think, I, I think at this point in my career, I cannot believe that I'm sitting in the middle of countries, the agency with modernization, and our partner government agencies, as well as the private sector, and coordinating this stuff. It's just been fantastic. So, Well, I could tell you, you know, you, I, I find it interesting you were talking about where, just as an example, using uh, FDA as one of the, you know, partnering agencies. I see a scenario in this and issuing the credentials where right off the bat, uh, a reciprocal agreement, and it's been talked about, and there's actually some legislation and regulations there where FDA and Health Canada in particular, two of our largest uh, medical device training companies, uh, countries and all that between Canada and the U.S., they've been trying to figure out how to gain reciprocal recognition of what Health Canada does on a uh, item as well as FDA. This is a phenomenal tool based on what I'm hearing you say that that could make that concept reality. So along with a whole host of others, but all right, that's fantastic. All right. So for the sake of time, unfortunately here, and, and we can talk more on this. So definitely Vinny, you know, you just tell us you want to come back and we can go into maybe a, a different aspect or do some other shows. It'll be fine. But what do we need to do? Let's say from the private sector, what could, what could we do from this perspective that you would like to see that for being with Congress or being it with the agencies or whatever, what can we do that would help facilitate some of these types of things? I would love it right now. If people would start familiarizing themselves with what the potential of this tech that we're looking into will do. Um, get involved with COAC, TSN, um, do some personal research, start to realize some of these benefits. The one thing that I'd like to end this, this podcast with is the fact that the credentials come in, and I, I mentioned earlier that there's images, means that it could even be passed down to the consumer. So ultimately, if we build the strength of this this correctly, you'll get soft law enforcement and you'll get allegiance to your product because you are facilitating that product. So that young lady who went out and, and bought that lipstick, right, unaware, maybe in this next new system, she would have been aware and she would have been able to see that, you know, there really wasn't any support for buying that product um, and, and, she, it, and we can keep them safe. And I think ultimately... If we start to look down that avenue, the benefits to businesses are much more than we're, we're considering it. It's not just a technological move. This is, I think, even potentially a social move um, that will help us along the lines eventually as we get the system built out. So any support we can get, we'll take. Um, watch what we're doing or get involved ultimately. And I, I think the businesses, uh, all the businesses that we're working with have been really very, very positive about what we're doing. So. I'd like to see that continue to move forward. Well, I will say that one of the things that we'll want, I mean, we've had some folks on from COAC. We'll do that again in particular on this particular topic uh, and, and bring them on as well as I want to zero in and highlight, you know, the TSN committees and subcommittees and see if we can get some of those folks on to have a discussion and start going through this. Third, folks, is that as far as the technology, we'll start looking at uh, identifying some links so that you can click on that and start uh, uh, 
you know, if you will, educating yourself on this. And finally, the the scenario on this, I think, uh, you know, with the different trade associations out there, I know we've had a good uh, relationship with the Brokers Association on some past things trying to, with the government shutdowns, we've had some great shows where they were uh, presenting their case. So we can come back around with the brokers. I'm sure they're heavily involved in some of this and, 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 and touch on this, as well as then any other folks out there that you, uh, you, you're invited to reach out to Lalo and myself. If there's a trade association that's interested in this and you want to come on, let's talk about it. So it's good, bad, or different. Let's, uh, if you think this is the worst thing, then, you know, we need to hear it from you. But on the flip side of it, I see some great, great positive, uh, things on this, uh, Vinny that, uh, uh you know, I kind of look at the deal where your, your department is kind of like the old aerospace, uh, Lockheed, uh, deal out in uh, California called Skunk Works. It's like, you know, they, <laughs> it's, it, it was the deal where uh, they would come up with an idea and they would mm-hmm. develop it, whatever, and test it out. And then they'd come out and be this, some phenomenal, uh, development. So I like the I'm, CIA, the beginnings of the CIA. That's what I, I always think. There, there you go. <laughs> I love and, it. And by the it. way, commercial operational advisory committee. I got it. The time is right. <laughs> yeah, there. Right. I got that down. I love it. All right. Well, Vinny, I appreciate you so much. And again, I hope that you're going to have the opportunity to, well, you have an open invitation. I'll say that. But if we can help facilitate discussions on this, just let us know. and We'll be able to get people on and, and talk through this because this has been, uh, our show has been something where people are, are learning a lot, but they're also taking action which is great, either educating themselves, taking action for their own company. But in this case, this would be something that would be great for our country. No, I I hope so. And um, I just want to thank you both for having me on. And I look forward to, uh, to reappearing and talking to you more about what we're doing soon. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for joining us. Simply Trade is brought to you by the generous contributions of Global Training Center. You can follow the show and GTC on LinkedIn or Twitter and other social networks. Make sure you check out the show notes in the description for a full rundown of today's show with all the important links. Also, make sure that you share this with a friend and subscribe on your favorite streaming platform. We really like hearing from you. If you enjoyed the show, make sure to rate and review wherever you listen to this podcast. If you or someone you know would like to be a guest on the show or would like to sponsor Simply Trade or suggest any topic you would like for us to discuss, please contact us via email at simplytrade at globaltrainingcenter.com or you can DM us on Twitter at simplytradepod. Thank you again for the privilege of your time. Happy trading. Simply Trade is not a law firm or an advisor. The topics and discussions conducted by Simply Trade hosts and guests should not be considered and is not intended to substitute legal advice. You should seek appropriate counsel for your own situations. These conversations and information are directed towards listeners in the United States for informational, educational, entertainment purposes only and should not be substituted for legal advice. No listener or viewer of this podcast should act or refrain from acting on the basis of information on this podcast without first seeking legal advice from counsel. Information on this podcast may not be up to date depending on the time of publishing and the time of viewership. The content of this posting is provided as is. No representations are made that the content is error free. The views expressed in or through this podcast are those of the individual speakers, not those of their respective employers or Global Training Center as a whole. All liability with respect to actions taken or not taken based on the contents of this podcast are hereby expressly disclaimed.